So today we're here to chat about a patient arriving, a child arriving into a district general hospital with a history of a known difficult airway. Um, in general, you can think of a difficult airway uh, defined as a situation where cl a clinician has experienced difficulty with uh, face mask ventilation, laryngoscopy, or intubation. The failure to manage an airway is one of the primary causes of morbidity and mortality in uh, both theatre and paediatrics and in A&E and paediatrics. So we have to think of what we want to preliminary look at uh, as we're preparing for this situation. The most urgent thing to look at is how urgent is the case? Um, is this an emergency? Do we have time to consider what we're going to do? Have we time to gather all the right uh, equipment and personnel together? And it's hugely important to gather the right information from the history. Um, this is a known difficult intubation, so there must be a history involved. And the, the history is either in, in the DGH that the patient has arrived into, or maybe with a specialist hospital um, down the road, for instance, in Belfast in our situation. So you need to get the hold of the notes, have a look at the history. You need to speak to people that may have been involved in it before. Somebody will have obviously declared this to be a difficult intubation or a difficult airway as it's a known difficult airway. And um, if, if it's possible to find out from, from the notes and from people involved what the, prob the exact problems were, it makes life a lot easier. So the key with all of these type of, of situations is, is about your preparation. Preliminary preparation involves assessing the situation, trying to get a hold of the history involved and get as much information from that history and from the chart as possible. Uh, it is very important to gather information from other hospitals if that's where the, the problem has been, for instance, in a specialist paediatric hospital. The key to is to find out what is the difficulty. Was the difficulty with bag mask ventilation? Was the difficulty with an intubation? Or is it an assumed difficulty due to the anatomy of the patient? Um, and one, once you've gathered that together, then you can proceed to the next bit of the preparation. So if the situation is difficult bag mask ventilation, this is the, by far the most difficult situation because you can get into trouble as soon as the child goes off to sleep. In an adult situation, you can look at awake um, intubation and awake procedures. This is obviously much more difficult in children and it's very rarely uh, possible except in the older, very cooperative teenager. The, the key again is looking at the history. Does the history specify exactly what the problem was, whether they were able to cope with the uh, mask ventilation at all, who was involved in it, was it inexperienced people, was it very experienced people? Did you need more than one person to do the to hold the mask, and did, were they able to sort the problem out with some simple maneuvers, or was it very difficult? And at this point, it should be in your head: should you be doing this at all? Is there some way that you can involve people who would be uh, more experienced in the, along this line, and whether it, it, you could transfer the case? If the situation is, is safe mask ventilation but difficult intubation, that's a much uh, easier in some ways situation to deal with because while they are, the patient is asleep, you can maintain the airway and you can take your time organising things for an intubation. So review the medical records, particularly thinking of intubation in this case. The grade of the laryngoscopy, Grade 1, obviously, full view of the glottis. Grade, grade 2, just the posterior commissure visible. Grade 3, tip of the epiglottis. Grade 4, no glottic structures available are visible. In general, anaesthetists tend to think of grade 2A and B. In grade 2, you can see a, a reasonable amount of the cords, and grade 2B is just the very back tip of the cords. Then in your examination, things you're looking for are facial symmetry, mouth opening, presence of oral pathology, and neck flexion extension. And these can be difficult to assess in children because you may not have any cooperation at all. So 
facial symmetry you should be able to get the whole of but mouth opening and uh, neck flexion extension may you may just have to sit and watch the patient for a while to see if there's uh, if you can gather that informa information rather than ask asking them to do it um Malin Paddy score may work in, in very cooperative children, and um, we'll, we'll go through that in a, in a second. But uh, it's much more useful in adults, and again, the, the, you're looking more at the teenager that's very cooperative for it to be of any use. Um, so the physical features that you might want to look for, uh, upper incisor length, and again, that can you can, a, a child who has recently got a, their big teeth, but... Um, is still not very very large themselves can that can be a significant issue uh, the alignment of the incisors themselves protrusion of the mandible mouth opening the palate if it's high arched or narrow some mandibular space thyromental different distance thyromental distance and Always remember to use the, the kids, if you're doing, talking about finger breadths, it's the children's own fingers that you're involved. The length of neck, if it's too short. Uh, the neck size increase circumference, that, that is, that, um, in adults, that is uh, something that, that does lead you towards thinking there would be a, um, a difficult intubation. But in children, it's, it's much less de definite that that has any impact at all on the, uh, on the difficulty of intubation. And then head and neck rates of motion, as I said. There's the Malin Paddy scoring system. And I won't go through it all, but in, in essence, it's the amount you can see through an open mouth in a cooperative person. So, so uh, summary of, of what you need to look at when you're thinking about the, the airway. Is it a potentially difficult airway? Look at the history, facial appearance, any syndromes involved, airway scoring. Is there a history of successful bag ventilation and how was, that, how was that achieved? Is the grade of direct laryngoscopy known? Do you have to consider indirect laryngoscopy or fiber optic bronchoscope? And do you, and it's, <laughs> do you need the difficult airway trolley near you? Oh, I think that's 100% you do need the difficult airway trolley near you. You plan for a failure of bag mask ventilation, superglottic airways, surgical intervention, an ENT airway team, if it's available, can, can be called. And then make sure you have the correct pre people around, uh, correct experienced assistance for you as, as the, either the anaesthetist or intubator, um, and then extra anaesthetists av available to help. Uh, anytime educated, educated hands are always very, very, very useful. Surgical team then, as I said, ENT on standby as well. So preparation of equipment, plan ahead. Bag mask is, is an underrated skill sometimes. It, the, uh, often the registrars who come and work with us, they're, they're so keen to get their intubations and, uh, and their lines and things. But one of the things that we're most keen that it, that someone leaves us with is this the ability to bag mask a, a child because that is the thing that'll get you out of a hole it's the thing that will allow you to temporize the situation until you get uh, more experienced help and getting uh, being able to maintain an airway with bag mask is the thing that will save the child superglottic airways can be very important they've become more and more used in emergency situations over the last 10 or 15 years, they, um, in, in a, a situation where you have a difficult intubation, you may in fact be able to use a superglottic airway successfully. And the, um, a lot of cases in, in theatres get done now with superglottic airways in known difficult intubations and it, it avoids the issue entirely. Multiple laryng laryngoscope blades. Um, all anaesthetists have their own favourite blades, particularly in children. Um, although I, I do use different blades for different scenarios, um, I, I always jokingly say that with a Miller 1 and a Mac 3 blade, you could pretty much intubate anybody. And I find the Miller 1 blade in, in small children um, is for 
children that are easy to intubate is, makes it slightly more difficult than maybe using a, a smaller Mac blade. But for children that are difficult to intubate, it's by far the best blade. Um, in my hands anyway. And I therefore feel that I, I should and therefore I do use the Miller One blade for almost all small children. My thinking being that if I use it for, for all the children, including the easy ones, then it'll be much easier to use it in, with the difficult children. Um, video laryngoscopes are uh, hugely important, um, especially uh, and, and increasingly so over the last number of years. The, the quality of them, the quality of the picture has become so much more. Um, the key with that is that you do not need to line up the oral uh, um, pharyngeal and laryngeal glottic areas. And you, so basically you're able to see around the corner with them. It takes a little bit of getting used to um, using the, um, either using a bougie or, or just, or forceps to move the, uh, to move the uh, tube into position and working uh, through a video scope is slightly different but we're all getting better and better at it in, in everything we do with uh, ultrasound and, and these type of video learning scopes but again it's important to use them um, at times when you're not dealing with a difficult patient because that enables you then when you have to use it under uh, duress that it's uh, much easier. The fiber optic bronchoscope has been around for a long time and is still a hugely important um, tool. Uh, we can either put it, send, put it down a modified uh, superglottic um, airway or just through the nose and uh, round while we're able to uh, bag the patient or allow them to breathe, particularly on a, on a mask. Um, you can, there are uh, angle pieces that have uh, uh, little bits of uh, on the top of them that allow you to put the fiber optic bronchoscope in while you still maintain the airway. And then the difficult airway cart. Uh, people have, there are many, um, out on the internet you can see many, op many options of, of what you can have in your difficult airway cart and it's very much something that you should set up locally but there are certain things that everybody's going to want on it. You've got uh, um, equipment for helping with the air airways, such as Goodell um, airways, superglottic airways, um, different types of, of tube, lots of different laryngoscope blades, um, and uh, then access to video laryngoscopes and possibly the fiber optic scope, although it generally is kept slightly separate from the difficult air airway um, cart. Um, and then an ability to, to um, possibly use uh, uh, needle ventilation um, and uh, help with a surgical airway may be kept on that cart as well. So the key factor in, in any of this is do not start until you're comfortable that you have the people and equipment necessary. If you can bag mass successfully then you're not in any rush. You can take your time, you can have a look, a quick look in, see how difficult it is and then uh, reset your plans, reset your positioning, and then have another look and then come back out again. There is no rush. And often the, the, the difficulties if, uh, you, that you, I have been called to help people with in the past is where they've tried to do something and don't stop whenever they get into trouble, uh, even when they were able to do bag mask ventilation. One of the keys with it is, is not to, to cause bleeding um, and not to cause problems that weren't there at the beginning. If the history is such that the patient has been uh, impossible to get a decent look with a, a direct laryngoscopy in the past and the people doing it were experienced, then you shouldn't try to do it because you're just likely to make the, the, your subsequent choices more difficult. So use uh, something that was, was done successfully in the past or move on to the next step and go with the video learning scope or the fiber optic learning scope from the, from the beginning as a planned intervention into a, an undamaged airway and, and pharyngeal region. Uh, children, obviously the, the awake option is very limited and you have to be very careful with the sedation that you give because in all of this you're trying to sedate the child in a way that they, they maintain breathing. So, Inhalational inductions can work very well. 
Uh, the the other option is is judicious use of IV, um, propofol, ketamine, um, all of those things. Are, are, as long as you use them in small increments, br bring them, bringing it up, sedating them slightly while hoping that they will maintain their their uh, breathing at the time. Muscle relaxants can be very important, but the the key to that is that you you are, you should only use muscle relaxants when you're comfortable that you can use bag mask ventilation, uh, and or it's the the last step that you know that once if you relax the patient you will be able to get the the tube in, and uh, as we've talked about fiber optic layering scopes and surgical airways. So. Difficult airway card, some of the things to make sure that you have on it. I think I've already mentioned most of these. Uh, the only thing that they end, some of the adjuncts, the end tidal CO2 to check because sometimes you, you may have got the tube in, but it's not actually all that easy to check that you've got it in. And end tidal CO2 will allow you to do that uh, quite quickly. Um, Ambu bags and suction catheters and forceps, all of these things should be available uh, on, the, on the tube along with stylets, tube changers and bougies on the difficult airway cart. So sedation as I chatted about, inhalational sedation can be very important because it allows you to keep them breathing throughout, throughout with, for instance, sevoflurian. You can get them quite deep and if they start to get too deep then they don't breathe as much and so that they regulate themselves to an extent as long as you can keep a good airway during that time. Ketamine can be very useful, it, it probably of, of all the other ones, um, of all the IV solutions, you probably maintain your airway um, the most of the, 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 and maintain your breathing the most. The only problem with it is you tend to increase the secretions and so you may need more suction. Midazolam and propofol both very useful. Propofol is is very good at dampening and, and reducing any reaction in the in the airway, but it has more of a knife edge as to when they stop breathing. So as long as you're comfortable with propofol and you've used it a lot in, in a theatre setting, then it can be a very useful uh, tool as well. Uh, as I said, try to maintain the spontaneous breathing. You may find that the best um, the best uh, plan for bag mask ventilation is for one person to maintain the airway if, the, if there's some facial asymmetry for instance or, or difficulty with jaw thrust and another person to do the bagging and so that's where two experienced operators, two anaesthetists are very useful. And as I said earlier they do not uh, try laryngoscopy if it's proven to be difficult in the past and direct laryngoscopy that is and particularly um, don't try multiple attempts if it's not successful the first time. So, in conclusion, as with anything we do, preparation is the key. Assessment of the situation, assessment of the child, assessment of the history in particular. This is a known difficult intubation, so there must be a history of difficult airway, difficult intubation. We need to look at that history and decide whether uh, it was in a, a, a situation where there were very experienced personnel looking after it and had difficulty, or was it somewhere where you may feel that they, they, the experience of the personnel was relevant to the story. If the, if the bag mask ventilation is safe in the history, then that gives you a lot more time and reduces a lot of the impetus to rush. But the urgency of the procedure is another key. Have we got time to gather a, a group of per people who would be appropriate to this? Have we got time to get all of the right equipment together? Have I got time to call for a surgical team? And indeed, have I got time to access the, a transport team that would help you with the intubation from a um, tertiary centre for paediatrics? Is the venue that you're going to do it appropriate? You don't have to rush in and do things in A&E if you can move to a better situation. For instance, a lot of our DDHs will move children up to theatres for uh, intubation purposes. Gather the, the right personnel. More than one anaesthetist is, is often handy. The experienced personnel, the, the nurses that are or ODAs that are going to assist you with the, knowing what equipment you're likely to need and hand you the right thing at the right time can make all the difference. And then make sure that you have the appropriate equipment. So the key is, don't rush and be prepared. 
I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on the subject.